don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Seer Jorah's face was drawn and sorrowful. Rhaegar was the last dragon, he told her. He warmed translucent hands over a glowing brazier where stone eggs smoldered red. As coals. One moment he was there and the next he was fading, his flesh colorless, less substantial than the wind. The last dragon, he whispered, thin as a wisp, and was gone. She felt the dark behind her, and the red door seemed farther away than ever. Dot. Don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Visories stood before her, screaming. The dragon does not beg, slut. You do not. Command the dragon. I am the dragon, and I will be crowned. The molten gold trickled. Down his face like wax, burning deep channels in his flesh. I am the dragon and I will. Be crowned. He shrieked, and his fingers snapped like snakes, biting at her nipples. Pinching, twisting, even as his eyes burst and ran like jelly down seared and blackened. Cheeks. Sansa. In the tower room at the heart of Megar's Holfast, Sansa gave herself to the darkness. She drew the curtains around her bed, slept, woke weeping, and slept again. When she could not sleep she lay under her blankets shivering with grief. Servants came and went, bringing meals, but the sight of food was more than she could bear. The dishes piled up on the table beneath her window, untouched and spoiling, until the servants took them away again. Sometimes her sleep was leaden and dreamless, and she woke from it more tired than when she had closed her eyes. Yet those were the best times, for when she dreamed, she dreamed of father. Waking or sleeping, she saw him, saw the gold cloaks fling him down, saw Cyrilin striding forward, unsheathing ice from the scabbard on his back, saw the moment. The moment when she had wanted to look away, she had wanted to. Her legs had gone out from under her and she had fallen to her knees, yet somehow she could not turn her head, and all the people were screaming and shouting, and her prince had smiled at her, H.E.T. smiled and shed felt safe, but only for a heartbeat, until he said those words, and her father's legs. That was what she remembered, his legs, the way they jerked when Sir Elin. When the sword Perhaps I will die too, she told herself, and the thought did not seem so terrible to her. If she flung herself from the window, she could put an end to her suffering, and in the years to come the singers would write songs of her grief. Her body would lie on the stones below, broken and innocent, shaming all those who had betrayed her. Sansa went so far as to cross the bedchamber and throw open the shutters. But then her courage left her, and she ran back to her bed, sobbing. The serving girls tried to talk to her when they brought her meals, but she never answered them. Once Grandmaster Paisel came with a box of flasks and bottles, too. Ask if she was ill. He felt her brow, made her undress, and touched her all over while her bedmaid held her down. When he left he gave her a potion of honey water and herbs and told her to drink a swallow every night. She drank it all right then and went back to sleep. She dreamt of footsteps on the tower stair an ominous scraping of leather on stone as a man climbed slowly toward her bedchamber, step by step. All she could do was huddle behind her door and listen, trembling, as he came closer and closer. It was Sir Elin. Bran. The oldest were men grown, seventeen and eighteen years from the day of their naming. One was past twenty. Most were younger, sixteen or less. Bran watched them from the balcony of Mester Lewin's turret, listening to them grunt and strain and curse as they swung their staves and wooden swords. The yard was alive. To the clack of wood on wood, punctuated all too often by thwacks and yowls of pain. When a blow struck leather or flesh, Sir Roderick strode among the boys, face reddening. Beneath his white whiskers, muttering at them one and all. Bran had never seen the old knight look so fierce. No, he kept saying. They don't fight very well, Bran said dubiously. He scratched Summer idly behind the ears as the deer wolf tore at a haunch of meat. Bones crunched between his teeth. For a certainty, Mester Lewin agreed with a deep sigh. The Mester was peering through his big Myrish lens tube, measuring shadows and noting the position of the comet that hung low in the morning sky. Yet given time, Sir Roderick has the truth of 
It. We need men to walk the walls. Your lord father took the cream of his guard to King's Landing, and your brother took the rest, along with all the likely lads for leagues around. Men you will not come back to us, and we must needs find the men to take their places. Brad stared resentfully at the sweating boys below. If I still had my legs, I could beat them all. He remembered the last time H.E.T. held a sword in his hand, when the king had come to Winterfall. It was only a wooden sword, yet H.E.T. knocked Prince Tommen. Area. The scent of hot bread drifting from the shops along the street of flour was sweeter than any perfume area had ever smelled. She took a deep breath and stepped closer to the pigeon. It was a plump one, speckled brown, busily pecking at a crust that had fallen between two cobblestones, but when Arya's shadow touched it, it took to the air. Her stick sword whistled out and caught it two feet off the ground, and it went down in a flurry of brown feathers. She was on it in the blink of an eye, grabbing a wing as the pigeon flapped and fluttered. It pecked at her hand. She grabbed its neck and twisted until she felt the bone snap. Compared with catching cats, pigeons were easy. A passing septon was looking at her askance. Here's the best place to find pigeon, Aria. Told him as she brushed herself off and picked up her fallen stick sword. They come for the crumbs. He hurried away. She tied the pigeon to her belt and started down the street. A man was pushing a load of tarts by on a two-wheel cart. The smells sang of blueberries and lemons and apricots. Her stomach made a hollow rumbly noise. Could I have one? She heard herself say. A lemon, or... Or any kind. The pushcart man looked her up and down. Plainly he did not like what he saw. Three. Coppers. Aria tapped her wooden sword against the side of her boot. I'll trade you a fat pigeon. She said. The others take your pigeon, the pushcart man said. The tarts were still warm from the oven. The smells were making her mouth water, but she did not have three coppers. Or one. She gave the pushcart man a look, remembering what Sirio had told her about seeing. He was short, with a little round belly, and when he moved he seemed to favor his left leg a little. She was just thinking that if she snatched a tart and ran he would never be able to catch her when he said, You be keeping your filthy hands off. The gold cloaks know how to deal with thieving. Denaries. The flies circled Kildrogo slowly, their wings buzzing, a low thrum at the edge of hearing that filled Donnie with dread. The sun was high and pitiless. Heat shimmered in waves off the stony outcrops of low hills. A thin finger of sweat trickled slowly between Donnie's swollen breasts. The only sounds were the steady clip of their horses' hooves, the rhythmic tingle of the bells in Drogo's hair, and the distant voices behind them. Donnie watched the flies. They were as large as bees, gross, purplish, glistening. The Dothraki called them bloodflies. They lived in marshes and stagnant pools, sucked blood from man and horse alike, and laid their eggs in the dead and dying. Drogo hated them. Whenever one came near him, his hand would shoot out quick as a striking snake to close around it. She had never seen him miss. He would hold the fly inside his huge fist long enough to hear its frantic buzzing. Then his fingers would tighten, and when he opened his hand again, the fly would be only a red smear on his palm. Now in crept across the rump of his stallion, and the horse gave an angry flick of its tail to brush it away. The others fleeted about Drogo, closer and closer. The coal did not react. His eyes were fixed on distant brown hills, the reins loose in his hands. Beneath his painted vest, a plaster of fig leaves and caked blue mud covered the wound on his breast. The herboyman had made it for him. Miri Mazdoir's poultice had itched and burned, and he had torn it off six days ago, cursing her for a Miji. The mud plaster was more soothing, and the herb women made him poppy wine as well. H.E.D. been drinking it heavily these past three days. When it was not poppy wine, it was fermented mare's milk or pepper beer. Yet he scarcely touched his food, and he thrashed and groaned in the night. Donnie could see how drawn his face had become. Rego was restless in her belly, kicking like a stallion, yet even that did not stir Drogo's interest as it had. Every morning her eyes found fresh lines of pain on his face when he woke from his troubled sleep. And now this silence. It was making her afraid. Since they had mounted up at dawn, he had said not a word. When she spoke, she got no answer but a grunt, and not even that much since. Midday. Catelan. 
The woods were full of whispers. Moonlight winked on the tumbling waters of the stream below as it wound its rocky way. Along the floor of the valley. Beneath the trees, war horses wickered softly and pawed at. The moist, leafy ground, while men made nervous jests and hushed voices. Now and again, she heard the chink of spears, the faint metallic slither of chain mail, but even those sounds were muffled. It should not be long now, my lady, Hellas Mullen said. He had asked for the honor of protecting her in the battle to come. It was his right, as Winterfell's captain of guards. And Rob had not refused it to him. She had thirty men around her, charged to keep her unharmed and see her safely home to Winterfell if the fighting went against them. Rob had wanted fifty. Catelyn had insisted that ten would be enough, that he would need every sword for the fight. They made their peace at thirty, neither happy with it. It will come when it comes, Catelyn told him. When it came, she knew it would mean death. Hill's death perhaps. Or hers, or Rob's. No one was safe. No life was certain. Catelyn was content to wait, to listen to the whispers in the woods and the faint music of the brook, to feel the warm wind in her hair. She was no stranger to waiting, after all. Her men had always made her wait. Watch for me, little cat, her father would always tell her, when he rode off to court or fair or battle. And she would, standing patiently on the battlements of River Run as the waters of the Red Fork and the Tumblestone flowed by. He did not always come when he said he would, and days would off times pass as Catelyn stood her vigil, peering out between crenels and through arrow loops until she caught a glimpse of Lord Holster on his old brown gelding, trotting along the river shore toward the landing. Did you watch for me? H.E.D. asked when he bent to bug her. Did you, little cat? Brandon Stark had bid her wait as well. I shall not be long, my lady, he had vowed. We will be wed on my return. Yet when the day came at last, it was his brother Eddard. Who stood beside her in the sept. Ned had lingered scarcely a fortnight with his new bride before he too had ridden off to war with promises on his lips. At least he had left her with more than words. He had. Tyrion. On a hill overlooking the King Road, a long trestle table of rough-hewn pine had been erected beneath an elm tree and covered with a golden cloth. There, beside his pavilion, Lord Tywin took his evening meal with his chief knights and lords bannermen, his great crimson and gold standard waving overhead from a lofty pike. Tyrion arrived late, saddles or, and sour, all too vividly aware of how amusing he must look as he waddled up the slope to his father. The day's march had been long and tiring. He thought he might get quite drunk tonight. It was twilight, and the air was alive with drifting fireflies. The cooks were serving the meat course five suckling pigs, skin seared and crackling, a different fruit in every mouth. The smell made his mouth water. My pardons, he began, taking his place on the bench beside his uncle. Perhaps it best charge you with burying our dead, Tyrion, Lord T. Wynne said. If you are as late to battle as you are to table, the fighting will all be done by the time you arrive. Oh, surely you can save me a peasant or two, father, Tyrion replied. Not too many, I won't want to be greedy. He filled his wine cup and watched a serving man carve into the pig. The crisp skin crackled under his knife, and hot juice ran from the meat. It was the loveliest sight Tyrion had seen in ages. Sir Adam's outriders say the Stark host has moved south from the twins, his father reported as his trencher was filled with slices of pork. Lord Freeze levies have joined them. They are likely no more than a day's march north of us. Please, father, Tyrion said. I'm about to eat. Does the thought of facing the Stark boy unman you, Tyrion? Your brother Jaime would be eager to come to grips with him. It'd sooner come to grips with that pig. Rob Stark is not half so tender, and he never smelled as good. Denerys. When the battle was done, Donnie rode her silver through the fields of the dead. Her handmaids and the men of Herkins came after, smiling and jesting among themselves. Dothraki hooves had torn the earth and trampled the rye and lentils into the ground. While Eric's and arrows had sown a terrible new crop and watered it with blood. Dying. Horses lifted their heads and screamed at her as she rode past. Wounded men moaned. 
and prayed. Jatkarin moved among them, the mercy men with their heavy axes, taking a harvest of heads from the dead and dying alike. After them would scurry a flock of small girls, pulling arrows from the corpses to fill their baskets. Last of all the dogs would come sniffing, lean and hungry, the feral pack that was never far behind the palisar. The sheep had been dead longest. There seemed to be thousands of them, black with flies, arrow shafts bristling from each carcass. Gologol's riders had done that, Donnie knew. No man of Drogol's Kalasar would be such a fool as to waste his arrows on sheep. When there were shepherds yet to kill. The town was afire, black plumes of smoke roiling and tumbling as they rose into a hard blue sky. Beneath broken walls of dried mud, riders galloped back and forth, swinging their long whips as they herded the survivors from the smoking rubble. The women and Children of Ogol's Kalasar walked with a sullen pride, even in defeat and bondage. They were slaves now, but they seemed not to fear it. It was different with the townsfolk. Donnie pitied them. She remembered what terror felt like. Mothers stumbled along with blank, dead faces, pulling sobbing children by the hand. There were only a few men among them, cripples and cowards and grandfathers. Sir Jor said the people of this country named themselves the Lhazarin, but the Dothraki called them Heshraki, the Lamb Men. Once Donnie might have taken them for Dothraki, for they had the same copper skin and almond-shaped eyes. Now they looked alien to her, squat and flat-faced, their black hair cropped unnaturally short. They were herders of sheep and eaters of vegetables, and Kaldrogo said they belonged south of the river bent. The grass of the Dothraki Sea was not meant for sheep. Donnie saw one boy bolt and run for the river. A rider cut him off and turned him, and the others boxed him in, cracking their whips in his face, running him this way and that. Catelan. As the host drooped down the causeway through the black bogs of the neck and spilled out into the riverlands beyond, Catelan's apprehensions grew. She masked her fears. Behind a face kept still and stern, yet they were there all the same, growing with every league they crossed. Her days were anxious, her nights restless, and every raven that flew over had made her clench her teeth. She feared for her lord father, and wondered at his ominous silence. She feared for her brother Admure, and prayed that the gods would watch over him if he must face the king's lair in battle. She feared for Ned and her girls, and for the sweet sons she had left. Behind at Winterfall. And yet there was nothing she could do for any of them, and so she made herself put all thought of them aside. You must save your strength for Rob, she told herself. He is the only one you can help. You must be as fierce and hard as the North, Catel and Tully. You must be a Stark for true now, like your son. Rob rode at the front of the column, beneath the flapping white banner of Winterfall. Each day he would ask one of his lords to join him, so they might confer as they marched. He honored every man in turn, showing no favorites, listening as his lord. Father had listened, weighing the words of one against the other. He has learned so. Much from Ned, she thought as she watched him, but has he learned enough? The Blackfish had taken a hundred picked men and a hundred swift horses and raced. I had to screen their movements and scout the way. The reports Sir Brynden's riders brought back did little to reassure her. Lord T. Wynne's host was still many days to the south. But Walder Frey, Lord of the Crossing, had assembled a force of near four thousand men at his castles on the Green Fork. Late again, Catelyn murmured when she heard. It was a trident all over, damn the man. Her brother Admir had called the banners. By rights, Lord Frey should have gone to join the Tully host at Riverrun, yet here he sat. Four thousand men, Rob repeated, more perplexed than angry. Lord Frey cannot help to fight the Lannisters by himself. Surely he means to join his power to ours. Does he? Catelyn asked. She had ridden forward to join Rob and Rabid Glover, his companion of the day. The vanguard spread out behind them, a slow-moving forest of area. Her father had been fighting with the council again. Arya could see it on his face when he came to table, late again, as he had been so often. The first course, a thick sweet soup. 
made with pumpkins, had already been taken away when Ned Stark strode into the small hall. They called it back to set it apart from the Great Hall, where the king could feast a thousand, but it was a long room with a high vaulted ceiling and bench space for two hundred at its trestle tables. My lord, Jory said when father entered. He rose to his feet, and the rest of the guard rose with him. Each man wore a new cloak, heavy gray wool with a white satin border. A hand of beaten silver clutched the woolen folds of each cloak and marked their wearers. As men of the Hans household guard, there were only fifty of them, so most of the benches were empty. Be seated, Eddard Stark said. I see you have started without me. I am pleased to know. There are still some men of sense in this city. He signaled for the meal to resume. The servants began bringing out platters of ribs, roasted in a crust of garlic and herbs. The talk in the yard is we shall have a tourney, my lord, Jory said as he resumed his seat. They say that knights will come from all over the realm to joust and feast in honor of your appointment as Hand of the King. Arya could see that her father was not very happy about that. Do they also say this is the last thing in the world I would have wished? Sansa's eyes had grown wide as the plates. A tourney, she breathed. She was seated between Septa Morton and Yainpool, as far from Arya as she could get without drawing a reproach from father. Will we be permitted to go, father? You know my feelings, Sansa. It seems I must arrange Robert's games and pretend to be honored for his sake. That does not mean I must subject my daughters to this folly. Oh, please, Sansa said. I want to see. Septa Morden spoke up. Princess Myrcella will be there, my lord, and her younger. Then Lady Sansa. All the ladies of the court will be expected at a grand event like this. Denaries. The Dothraki Sea, Sir Jorah Mormont said as he reigned to a halt beside her on the top of the ridge. Beneath them, the plain stretched out immense and empty, a vast flat expanse that reached to the distant horizon and beyond. It was a sea, Donnie thought. Past here, there were no hills, no mountains, no trees nor cities nor roads, only the endless grasses, the tall blades rippling like waves when the winds blew. It's so green, 